This video outlines how to take the measurements required to determine maximum allowable standing height for bilateral lower limb amputees in accordance with the classification rules and regulations. Section 1 Introduction To determine maximum allowable standing height, classifiers will need to take one or more of the following five measurements upper arm length, forearm length, thigh length, sitting height, and arm span. The first three measurements, upper arm length, forearm length, and thigh length, can be referred to collectively as body segment lengths. Exactly which measurements are required to determine maximum allowable standing height for a given athlete will depend on whether the athlete is male or female and whether they are a bilateral transfemoral amputee or a transtibial amputee or other. To determine exactly which measurements are required in each case, please refer to the classification rules and regulations. In circumstances where there is a discrepancy between what is described in the video and what is described in the rules and regulations, classifiers should adhere to the rules and regulations. Section 2. Equipment required. To measure segment lengths, you will need the following equipment. A pen or pencil suitable for marking the skin and wipes. This ensures that marks can easily be made on human skin and wiped off. These are used for landmarking, which needs to be done prior to measurement of segment lengths. In addition, a segmometer should always be used to measure lengths because it provides a straight line distance between two landmarks. A tape measure is not a suitable substitute because it will be distorted by the contours of the body and does not provide a straight line distance. To measure sitting height, you will need a stadiometer, this can be freestanding or mounted on a wall, and a box to sit on. The box should provide the athlete with a firm level sitting surface it should be approximately 45 to 50 centimetres high. This is low enough so that hips are not pushed into excessive flexion. This shot shows the hips at a suitable angle. The box shouldn't have cushioning and shouldn't have a backrest. It should be in a stable position. Moulded plastic chairs that do not have a flat sitting surface are unsuitable. Athletes should remove their prosthetics for this measurement. To measure arm span, you will need a flat wall with a relatively smooth surface. The wall should be solid enough for an athlete to lean against. Two pieces of paper and sticky tape. The pieces of paper should be stuck on the wall so that when the athlete is in the correct position to have their arm span measured, one piece of paper is under their left hand and the other under their right. This will protect the wall when making the marks required to take the measurement. A marking pen with a fine point is also needed. A thick mark can make it difficult to determine where the measurement should be taken. Section 3. Measurement procedures for segment length, sitting height and arm span. Section A. To measure segment length correctly, two steps are required. Firstly, landmarking the end points of each segment. And secondly, positioning the athlete and taking the measurement. All segment lengths should be taken on the right-hand side of the body unless there are marked anatomical anomalies such as an amputated right upper limb. Teaching point. Small errors in landmarking or measuring technique can make a large difference in the maximum allowable standing height, so it's imperative that these landmarking and measurement protocols are adhered to rigorously. Landmarking. To measure upper arm length requires landmarking of the acromiali and the radiali. The acromiali is the point at the superior and lateral border of the acromion process. 
midway between the anterior and posterior borders of the deltoid muscle when viewed from the side. To locate the acromiali, the athlete should be sitting or standing in a comfortable, erect position with their arm hanging comfortably on the side in a slightly pronated position. The classifier should stand on the right-hand side of the athlete and palpate the cervical, using the right hand and the spine of the scapula using the left hand. Walk your fingers laterally along these bony prominences at the same time. They gradually converge and the point at which they meet will be the acromion. Find the most superior and lateral point of the acromion and, using your fingernail, make a small horizontal indentation on the skin at that point. Mark this with a horizontal line using the pencil. Teaching points. It is critical that the line is horizontal and not vertical. Make sure the skin is not stretched upwards or downwards when making the indentation with your fingernail. Otherwise, when the skin is released, the indentation will no longer be over the bony landmark. The radiale is the point at the proximal and lateral border of the head of the radius. To locate the radiale, the classifier stands at the side of the athlete and palpates downward in the lateral dimple of the right elbow. You should clearly feel the space between the capitulum of the humerus and the head of the radius. The classifier can confirm that they have found the correct landmark by asking the athlete to gently pronate and supinate the forearm backwards and forwards so that the head of the radius can be felt to rotate. Find the most proximal and lateral point of the radius and, using your fingernail, make a small horizontal indentation on the skin at that point. Mark this with a horizontal line using the pencil. Teaching points. The line should be horizontal and not vertical. It should be on the head of the radius, not in the joint space or on the humerus. In this position, the skin of the elbow can be particularly loose and therefore the classifier should take extra care to make sure that the skin is not stretched upwards or downwards when making the indentation with the fingernail. To measure forearm length requires landmarking the radiale and stylion. The stylion is the most distal point on the lateral margin of the styloid process of the radius. To locate the stylion, ask the athlete to maximally extend their right thumb and find the anatomical snuff box. The classifier can find the end of the styloid process by placing their thumb or forefinger into the anatomical snuff box and asking the athlete to relax the thumb. Find the lateral aspect of the styloid process and then identify the most superior point on the lateral aspect. Teaching points. The mark should be on the lateral aspect of the styloid process, which is covered by just a thin layer of skin, not in the joint space. The line should be horizontal and not vertical. The next section demonstrates how to locate trochanterian and tibiale laterale, the landmarks required for measurement of thigh length. Remember, these landmarks will only be required for below knee amputees, not above knee. Please note that the video demonstration for these landmarks is performed with the athlete in standing, but that this is not how the athlete should be positioned. Instead, the athlete should be positioned in side lying with the right leg on top and the left leg underneath. The bench they lie on should not have a hard flat surface. It should be sufficiently cushioned so that the athlete can lie comfortably and the left hip is not put under too much pressure. Trochanterion is the most superior point on the greater trochanter of the femur, not the most lateral point. 
With the athlete in side lying, the classifier places his or her right hand as close as possible to the greater trochanter of the right femur. Applying pressure with the right hand will permit this large bony prominence to be located. To confirm you are on the correct landmark, ask the participant to slowly internally and externally rotate their right leg so that the greater trochanter can be felt to rotate. Having located the greater trochanter, use the fingers to palpate upwards to locate the most superior point of this bony landmark. Using the thumbnail, make a skin indentation at the level of the most superior point and then mark it with a small horizontal line using your pencil. Teaching points. This landmark will not be required for bilateral above knee amputees. This site can be very difficult to locate, particularly in very muscular people or those with thick adipose tissue over the greater trochanter. To locate the tibiale laterale, have the athlete slightly flex the right knee and beginning to the lateral side of the patella, find the joint space bounded by the lateral condyle of the femur superiorly and the anterolateral portion of the head of the tibia, inferiorly. Keep moving laterally with the thumb, feeling the joint space narrow until it becomes a single line. Move your thumb back into the joint space and have the athlete straighten their knee. Move your thumb to the joint line and make a small horizontal line on the joint line at approximately the midpoint between the anterior and posterior surfaces of the knee. Teaching points. This landmark should always be done with the prosthesis removed. This is often a difficult landmark to correctly locate due to the thick lateral ligaments that run across the knee joint. Note that this landmark cannot be located on above knee amputees. Positioning and measurement. After all necessary landmarking has been completed, positioning and measurement can commence. The following points should be noted. Two people are required to execute these measurements accurately. One person taking the measurements, the measurer, and the other to record the measurements, the recorder. On some occasions, the recorder is not only responsible for recording the result, but also assists with taking the measurement. Teaching points. To reduce recording mistakes, the measurer should call out the measurement to the recorder. The recorder should repeat the measurement back to the measurer and the measurer should confirm that the recorder has correctly repeated the measurement by saying correct. Take all the measurements required in a logical order and record these as trial one. All the measurements should then be taken a second time in exactly the same order and recorded as trial two. Once you have completed the second measurement, check that it is not more than 1% greater or smaller than the first measurement. If there is less than or equal to 1% difference between the trial 1 and trial 2, the mean should be calculated and entered into the formula for calculating maximum allowable standing height. For any measurement where there is more than 1% difference between trial 1 and trial 2, take another measurement and record as trial 3. The median result is the one that should be entered into the formula for calculating maximum allowable standing height. Teaching points. Complete all measurements required for trial 1 before taking your measurements a second time. Don't measure once and then a second time straight away. Upper arm length is the distance between the acromiali and the radiali. The athlete assumes a relaxed standing position with the arms hanging by the sides. The right forearm should be pronated. One branch of the segmometer is held on the acromiali while the other branch is placed on the radiali. 
If the branches of the segmometer are too short to allow clearance of the deltoids, a large sliding caliper may be used. Teaching points. Be sure your head is right down at the same level as the measurement display, otherwise reading errors can occur. The forearm is measured as the distance between the radiale and stylion. The athlete assumes a relaxed standing position with their arms hanging by the sides. The right forearm should be slightly externally rotated to a mid-pronated position. The distance between the radiale and the stylion landmarks is measured by placing one segmometer branch against the radiale and the other branch on the stylion landmark. The thigh length is measured as the distance between the trochanterion and the tibiale laterale. One branch of the segmometer is placed on the trochanterion and the other branch is placed on the tibiale laterale side. Sitting height is measured as the distance from the sitting platform to the vertex, the highest point on the head when the head is held in the Frankfurt plane. To take this measurement correctly requires two people. First, measure the distance from the floor to the top of the sitting platform and record this measurement. It will need to be subtracted from all sitting height measurements. The athlete should be seated in an erect position on a measuring box or level platform such that their pelvis and shoulder girdle are in contact with the stadiometer. It is not necessary for the head to also be in contact. The head is positioned in the next step. The hands or forearms should be resting comfortably on the thighs. Once correctly seated, position the head in the Frankfurt plane by aligning orbitale, the lower border of the eye socket, at the same horizontal level as the trigon, the notch superior to the tragus of the ear. The classifier can check that the head is in the right position by placing one thumb carefully just below the lower border of the eye socket and their index finger on the trigion to make sure that they are as close to the same horizontal level as possible. To take the measurement, the athlete is instructed to take and hold a deep breath and, while keeping the head in the Frankfurt plane, the measurer applies gentle upward lift through the mastoid processes. The recorder places the measuring arm of the stadiometer firmly down on the vertex, crushing the hair as much as possible. The recorder then holds the arm of the stadiometer in place while the athlete exhales and slightly moves away and the measure is taken. The sitting height of the athlete is calculated by subtracting the height of the sitting platform from the measurement obtained with the athlete sitting on the platform. Teaching points. If the stadiometer is freestanding, make sure that the athlete does not lean too heavily against it when they are being positioned. Care must be taken to ensure the athlete does not contract the gluteal muscles or push with the legs when the measurement is being taken. Big hair can lead to invalid measurements and the athlete should be required to flatten hair as much as possible. Arm span is measured as the distance from one fingertip to the other when the arms are abducted to 90 degrees at the shoulder and the elbows, wrists and fingers are fully extended. To take this measurement correctly requires two people. The recorder and the measurer should each have a piece of sticky tape and a sheet of paper. Begin by positioning the athlete so that they are standing against a wall with the recorder on one side and the measurer on the other. Ask the athlete to keep their arms straight and raise them to approximately 90 degrees. The measurer should then tape their piece of paper securely to the wall in the vicinity of where the hands rose to. This is so that, when the athlete formally adopts the required position, the final position will be able to be marked and permit measurement without damaging the wall.
When the paper is in position, the athlete should be asked a second time to abduct their arms to 90 degrees at the shoulders with the elbows, wrists and fingers fully extended and with the palms facing forward. The recorder and the measurer are responsible for ensuring that the arm on their side is at 90 degrees and in the correct position. When they are satisfied, each should make a mark on the paper at the level of the end of the tip of the longest finger. A segmometer is used to measure the distance between the marks on the wall. Teaching point. Fingernails should not be used as landmarks for the end of fingers. The protocols in this film were adapted from the ISAC protocols. The arm span description was adapted from Norton and Olds, 1992. The rest from an abridged version of the ISAC manual. Please refer to the classification rules and regulations. For details on how to use the measurements to determine maximum allowable standing height.